Okay, is that uh, displaying okay? I'm sure you'll stop me if it's not. Yep, no, this, uh, this looks good to me. Okay, thank you, Meno, and thanks everybody um, for, for coming to this uh, talk. It's really exciting to have an opportunity to speak to an audience that's very different from the audience that I normally speak to, um, which is predominantly astronomers, as you may guess. So uh, Meno is right, and um, the work that I'm talking about today is the work that we're doing at the Office of Astronomy for Development, and very much around trying to, um, to see where the skills, the techniques, the methods of astronomy can find um, application um, beyond astronomy, right? So just to give a quick outline of uh, what, what the talk will be about today, I'm gonna explain first of all, um, what is astronomy for development? Then I'm gonna explain, um, you know, touch briefly on the Office of Astronomy for Development's collaboration gateway. And then I'll talk a bit about the kinds of data and the methods that we employ to analyze that data in astronomy. And then maybe give um, at the end two examples of sort of these cross-disciplinary projects where uh, some of those methods have been applied um, in different contexts. So I think that uh, I'll be very interested in, in participating in the discussion at the end, um, you know, to to see if there's particular overlap for, for projects uh, between astronomy and the digital humanities. Okay, so while astronomy is all about um, looking up at the sky and trying to um, understand the physics and how things work um, in the heavens, astronomy for development is focused very much on um, the sustainable development goals, obviously, and you know how things are are working and what our challenges are on Earth. And so these things don't seem to have, um, you know, any clear connection in a way. Um, astronomy is very much, you know, a science that does not by definition really have um, application, immediate application on Earth. But there are ways um, in which it does impact, right? So here are a couple of ideas, you know, for example, Things like um, partnerships with industries that promote keeping um, sort of light pollution to a low level, which benefits astronomers and they're very much interested in it. But those kinds of partnerships can also be used towards more sustainable lighting solutions, um, you know, in terms of clean energy and in terms of uh, better infrastructure and innovation. And of course, there are other examples for like things we'll talk about today, training our astronomy students. Um, astronomy is quite a big draw card into the sciences. Um, training these students to apply these kinds of analysis skills in different sectors. So, you know, teaching them the tools and the methods they might need to solve an astronomy problem, but then going a step further and realizing that actually these problem solving skills are much more widely applicable than astronomy. And that's kind of uh, the focus that we'll have today. So I'll just give a brief introduction to um, our office, the Office of Astronomy for Development. And I don't think you need to read this whole slide. There's a lot of stuff in here. But I think what's quite interesting is that as astronomers, we see, you know, studying stars, uh, galaxies, um, and just trying to understand the universe as a very kind of numerical and data-driven science, you know, and you have to apply the physics this way and, you know, measure the light that way, and then you get to these conclusions. And that is true. You can see this field is becoming largely data-driven now. But on the other hand, it's a field that is like motivated by a very sort of human side of all of our personalities, right? It's just, it's a purely studied out of curiosity. And, you know, the interest in understanding, you know, why are things the way they are? You know, uh, what is our place in the universe? How do stars burn? You know, those kinds of uh, fairly fundamental why questions are the, are the real drivers um, in astronomy. And so while you have all these blue circles, as you can see around the bottom of the screen here, things like the maths, um, the chemistry, the physics that you have to apply in order to do astronomy, and you have to couple those with some pretty cool tech stuff like, you know, optics, machine learning, 
signal processing, sometimes you even have to launch observatories into space to get all this cool tech and all this physics. But at the same time, there's also this really deep connection between you know, ourselves and culture and society that um, is one of the facets of astronomy. So for some people, it provides um, the sense of perspective or this um, inspiration. Often it's used as a gateway to other science because of that kind of, you know, sense of this awe-inspiring nature of studying things in the sky. And for many of us, it also forms um, a link with our communities or our ancestors in terms of, of culture, right? And so it's these kinds of really wildly different facets of astronomy that I think make it quite an interesting tool to try and apply um, in, a, in a development context. So I'll tell you a bit now in the next few slides about our work at the Office of Astronomy for Development. Um, this office is based in Cape Town at, um, at the observatory, in observatory. Um, it's been there since 2011, and it's a partnership between the International Astronomical Union, which is the body of professional astronomers, it's a, it's a global body, and the National Research Foundation with support uh, from DSI. And it's founded on this ethos of humility with a kind of a slogan, astronomy for a better world. And although astronomers think they do know a lot, um, you know, the idea is really to say that we don't know how things are done everywhere. And so there's a lot of, of learning to be had across disciplines and, and, you know, across geographical boundaries as well. And due to that um, idea of learning across geographical boundaries, we also have a number of regional offices. So our head office is in Cape Town, but we then have 11 regional offices of astronomy for development um, situated throughout the world, as you can see on this map. And the idea here is that, you know, different parts of the world have different development priorities. They have different ways of implementing um, the mandate of astronomy for development for their, their particular regions. Um, and so that's, that's the, um, that's the um, motivation behind these regional offices. <clears throat> Another core part of the activities um, and carrying out this mandate of astronomy for development is an annual call for proposals that we launch. Um, and this normally is advertised in around um, April, May. And in the years that this call has, has been launched, um, we've dispersed over a million euros now through 200 uh, different projects in over 100 countries. And this is really a call that's open to um, anyone in the world. Um, if you can think of a good way of using some of the te techniques of astronomy to impact somehow on, on socioeconomic development, then that call is open to you. And normally those small sort of seed grants, you know, a few thousand euros. But if you think of some of the projects that are happening, um, for example, these projects might be around um, getting clean water and sanitation to a community around a telescope uh, in Indonesia. A few thousand euros can often go quite a long way. Um, in those areas. So I'll just give you um, a flavor. I mean, I've already talked about the project in Indonesia, but maybe just to give you a flavor of some of our other projects. So these projects are not run at um, the Office of Astronomy for Development. Um, the funding is dispersed from there, and then the projects are run by individual PIs with, within their regions uh, anywhere across the globe. Uh, so one of these um, instantiations is this Astrolab project. And the idea here is that, you know, part of the physics curriculum is, in, is doing um, experimental physics. So often that requires some kind of laboratory um, with different types of equipment to understand this process of, you know, measuring things, analyzing the data, writing up the results. But not all universities have access to the kind of infrastructure that you need to uh, run an experimental physics course. And so this Astrolab project looks at um, providing access to telescopes um, through a web browser. And you actually observe on the telescope live, take your data, and then you analyze the data offline, of course, um, write up the results. And so whilst it's not exactly the same as running a, a physics lab, 
it really does give you a feel for, you know, how working with data is sometimes very dirty and things go wrong and, you know, what you need to do in order to, to understand this kind of scientific process. And they have just highlighted there um, the two SDGs, quality education and, and industry innovation and infrastructure, which we think this project speaks most strongly to. Another project very different from the Astrolab is this Aminar project. And this is a project that ran in 2019 between um, Spain and Algeria. And the idea here is really to inspire the Sarahi uh, community, which is a, a community of, of displaced people um, through the wonders of, of the universe. And there's an exchange program between um, Spain and Algeria, um, mostly focused on um, children, so it's focusing again on, on education and on reducing inequalities. So that's, that's kind of a flavor um, of what the Office of Astronomy for Development is about. Um, and in addition to this kind of call for proposals, we also um, nurture a number of um, other sort of initiatives, our, our flagship projects. And we're also looking very much to create the space where the magic can happen. So that's the kind of space where we can bring together techniques from one discipline, maybe astronomy, and the questions or even techniques from another discipline. And so we've seen these kinds of, of things happen, but how do you create an environment where those, those little sparks of magic uh, happen more frequently, right? So a couple of years ago, we saw, you know, in terms of um, global science, we saw the merger of the International Social Sciences Council and the International Council of Science into the International Science Council. And so we can see that that really is um, a kind of a response to the challenges that we're facing in the SDGs, right? Um, these global challenges require solutions that are not totally science driven and not totally human driven, but in fact, a mesh of those two kinds of um, solutions. And again, we see these dis interdisciplinary conversations happening. This is uh, two particular examples from the UK where um, um, two different projects have been funded. I know about these because they have a sort of astronomy angle uh, one is the DARA Big Data Project that, uh, that we work closely with, and they bring together um, astronomy, agriculture, and health sciences um, because of the common um, methods of analyzing the data from these different fields. All of them you know, deal with large data sets and sort of machine learning or data science kind of problems. And so it's the kind of commonality and tools that is the... Um, what pulls these different fields together. Again, here you can see the STFC Food Network um, that has brought together, it's, it's yet a different initiative that brings together agriculture, many different parts of agriculture from supply chain to, um, to sort of climate um, and, and uh, weather prediction to, um, to, lot, to big data sets. And again, there's a, an astronomy component there. So one of the projects was, um, techniques used to measure the temperatures of galaxies were being applied now um, to look at uh, suitable to measure suitable times for of, of ovulation in cattle. So these are a kind of application of the same um, way of measuring something, but in two very different contexts. So at the end of last year, the Office of Astronomy for Development uh, launched this kind of collaboration gateway. And I think this is kind of um, an area where we'd like to make this magic happen. I don't think we can make it happen. I think it happens on its own. But if we can create some, some favorable environment for that, then, then this could be a great place for that. And so the idea here is that it could be a number of different kinds of projects. They could be research collaborations. They could be looking at ways of optimizing certain processes. They could even be things like um, on the ground support, such as uh, outreach or, or those kinds of things, where we can either initiate a project with the help of experts, or we can engage in that project with the help of um, astronomers or other people who may want to volunteer their time or skills. 
and then of course um, implement those projects as you can see um, in that blue, that final blue dot at the bottom of the page. So the idea here is really to create that kind of space where you might be able to develop some sort of materials that allow someone who wants to engage to get up to speed and then they then participate uh, in the project. So I'll come back to this at the end once I've gone through some of the worked examples because um, it'll probably be a bit more relevant then. So at some point I said data is a common language. I'm not sure data is always a common language, but maybe the way that you deal with the data is kind of the common language because I'll chat now a bit about what kind of data we use um, as astronomers. And this is a beautiful picture. I think many of you may have seen this already. It's a picture um, taken from the Hubble Space Telescope. And it was taken when uh, Hubble pointed at pretty much an empty patch of sky and just exposed for a number of weeks, actually. And it turns out that every little fuzzy blob in this image is its own galaxy. And so for so many of us see the see our own galaxy at night and pretty much all the stars that we can see with the naked eye as we see the Milky Way overway, overhead at night are within our own galaxy. But these are all galaxies outside of our own galaxy and incredibly um, far away in space, some of them. There's one single star here, which is this little spot over here and every other little dot here is a galaxy similar to the Milky Way spread out in, in space. So it really just gives you a sense of um, the scale and the size of the universe and also uh, what we can explore. So how do we actually know stuff about the universe? I mean, it's all very nice to take pictures through telescopes or to look through them um, with our eyes, but how do we, do we learn anything about the universe by doing so? And we have three main ways of doing that in astronomy. We can use light. So you've seen the picture uh, from the Hubble Space Telescope is made with light. We can also detect certain particles that come to Earth from out of space. So those could be um, particles that come from the sun. It could be um, other particles, highly energetic particles, uh, like cosmic rays, or they could be particularly low energy particles that don't interact like uh, neutrinos. And then in the last decade, we found a new window onto the universe, which is through the detection of, of gravitational waves. But I'm just gonna focus on light today because it's been around the longest. And I think it's easy for us to relate to because, um, sorry, light hasn't been around the longest. Everything has been around, right? But we've been detecting light as astronomers for the longest. So we detect light uh, often through images. And here you can see uh, an image of a, a part of the night sky. Uh, and you can see this image is actually taken uh, with a lot of uh, little chips. Uh, these are the same kinds of chips that you just have in your, in your mobile phone. All of them uh, mosaiced together to make that kind of funny uh, shape. And you can see that uh, you can use some kind of software to, to make a catalog and you can catalog the stars and galaxies that are on that image by the position in the image, um, the intensity of the light, and maybe some other um, categories that you want to ascribe to them. And then you can go a step further with the light. You can send it through a prism, and then you can separate it into its colors. And then you can make this thing called a spectrum here, which will tell you um, at a particular wavelength, how bright is that light? So the blue side is on, is on the left, uh, the red side is on the right, and you can see that most of the light is a bit faint, but you've got a particularly bright spikes going through here. And this is incredibly useful for helping us to understand what's going on um, in the sky, because we know that um, the elements that make things have their own particular signatures in light. And so looking at the signatures from stars and galaxies help us to work out um, the composition of, of what's in these stars and these galaxies. 
And in fact, these uh, the spectroscopy helps with much more than that. It also helps us to measure things like magnetic fields. It helps us to sort of bracket things in a temperature and it helps us to measure speeds of things. So, um, so there's actually quite a lot of uh, analytical information that you can get from this. Then I have to say that astronomers are, um, are quite obsessive about time series. Um, so this picture here is showing you in the top panel, um, it's time on the um, bottom axis and it's showing you the measurement of brightness at all these different times. So the top panel is showing these individual measurements over 4,000 days, approximately 10 years. And you can't really see it from that picture, but the light from this particular star is actually varying on a two and a half day period. So when you fold the light curve on this two and a half day period, then you can see this beautiful smooth pattern of variation that you see in the second panel. And so this is a particular um, thing for astronomers. They love finding periodic variations because it tells them things about either um, rotation of stars or stars orbiting each other. And you can do all sorts of uh, fun physics with that. And then of course you can go a step further and you can see how um, your spectrum changes with time. So um, if I go two, two pictures back here, um, remember we had a wavelength along the bottom and then we had a, a kind of intensity uh, on the Y axis here. And so this is the next picture that I'm showing is just a whole bunch of these things stacked up over time, but now the intensity is in terms of color. So you can see the, the really bright bits are in red. You've still got wavelength along the bottom, but now you've actually got a time axis along the top. And so you can see these kinds of changes happening in brightness over time as those little, um, as those little red areas swish from side to side. And this is actually because uh, what we're looking at is two uh, stars, one with a very bright spot on it that are orbiting each other. Um, you know, over a period of a couple of days. So th that's kind of the data that we have as astronomers. Um, and then we use uh, different kinds of tools and methods to analyze these data. I've already mentioned that we, you know, we get from images to catalogs. And um, of course, we use a lot of statistics, right? Because we have to, I think like most people, we have to understand um, what are the distributions um, in brightness of a particular kind of star and why is the distribution like that? So we use a lot of statistics and mathematics uh, to do astronomy. And then in terms of um, our kind of digital process, we do things like simple scripting. So that might be, you know, in order to get from the image into the catalog, there's a lot of steps that have to, that are quite repetitive. And so these are, these scripts are just ways of making sure that those steps run in the right order and the same order every time without um, us sitting there and baby and babysitting it along the way. Then we also, most astronomers now use Python programming, but we still program in C. And those are particularly for computationally intensive problems, but also a lot for simulations because um, often astronomers will try to create a simulation of maybe a fake universe with some kind of initial conditions. They'll run it through these time steps and then try and compare it with an observation to see, um, you know, to see if they fit. And of course, nowadays, um, a lot of the analysis is happening through machine learning. So that was, um, I think, an, an undergraduate degree in astronomy in uh, 10 minutes. So um, thanks very much for your patience with that. And what I think I'll go on to now is some of the examples of cross-disciplinary projects that we've been um, running or supporting at the OAD. And so these are our projects that are not actually astronomy focused as you'll, you'll see. And so I'll try to make you know, the link with astronomy a bit later on. So the first project is uh, around sentiment uh, analysis uh, for COVID-19. 
and this project came about as part of a collaboration to develop or at least to introduce data science skills in some of the uh, partner countries for the square kilometer array. So um, it's a project that was, um, it's a joint effort between the Star Big Data idea, which is the um, Inter-University Data in Center for Data Intensive Astronomy, and they have a um, um, computational resources that supported the project and between us at the OAD. So we just developed this as a kind of a tutorial for a virtual hackathon uh, in Zambia in 2020. And the idea was really to introduce um, the students to some of the skills that they needed to um, manage certain kinds of data um, and to implement some of these machine learning toolkits. So we, we were just really looking at uh, how you would measure sentiment around uh, COVID-19 and there's sort of structured in some tutorials then with a the project at the end. So the data set here is not astronomy related at all. It comprises tweets about COVID-19. And the idea is you download this uh, set of tweets, uh, clean the text of the tweets. So you might be doing things like removing any hyperlinks in it, uh, these things called stop words. I'm sure you guys are far more familiar with these than I am. And then one of the phases of the project was looking at certain existing categorization tools to explore sentiments. So there's a, already a number of um, categorization tools written in Python, these text blob and beta things, and to see how those do, and then compare them to some of the machine learning implementations. So those, we tried to supervise learning, um, approach with some labeled data, which meant that we had gone through and labeled all the tweets beforehand, and then could they train their algorithm um, to recognize sentiment based on that. And then we also had an implementation that looked um, at a more computationally intensive version, which was a transfer learning with this library called BERT. And, and in this context, the tutorials were presented um, in Python using these Jupyter Notebooks. Um, I think many of you may have, have tried one or two Jupyter Notebooks. It's a very nice way of, of managing the code, but with a lot of explanations around the code as well. So it's, it's perfect for learning and for exploratory data analysis. And then, you know, we found the categorization and the supervised learning is not too resource intensive. But the transfer learning step, i.e. this implementation of, of BERT, actually needed significant uh, computational resources. And so I've already mentioned that the tutorials were around um, to walk them through these three sections and then to open up um, to the students to see if they could uh, answer a particular research question, maybe around, you know, what is the sentiment around lockdowns or what's the sentiment around COVID vaccines uh, in this country compared to this country, because you can separate uh, tweets uh, in terms of location or something like that. So if you are interested, all the tools for this project is available on this GitHub repository, and they are um, quite nicely explained in the Jupyter Notebooks. So then how does this link to astronomy, right? The topic is entirely different. One of them is looking at something particularly human sentiment and, you know, what I've explained um, earlier is galaxies, right? So the methods though are very much the same. So this is classification. So using this machine learning classification, you can either classify a sentiment or you can classify a galaxy. So that's kind of the level of similarity of the tool. And of course, all the ways that we sort out the data, there's, there's quite a lot of similarity there. So you have to do a lot of preparation of the data. You have to have the um, sorting and cleaning of the data. And of course, um, you know, the application of these machine learning libraries are the same. So that's one of the examples which focused on the, the sentiment analysis. Another example that I can just, of a project that we've done um, at the OED is um, the size and patterns of, of urban informality. 
And that project is led by uh, Tawanda Jengosa, who's our development economist at the Office of Astronomy for Development. And at the time of this project, he was also um, a PhD student at the University of Stellenbosch in the, re in the RECEP group. And so he was looking at how you could trace something that is, you know, by definition difficult to trace um, an informal economy um, in, a, in a data scarce environment. So he was wondering if one could use satellite images um, to identify areas uh, around Harare that were informal trading or informal housing or, or the, these kinds of things. And so for part of his PhD, we employed the Zooniverse platform to do this. And Zooniverse is a, is a citizen science platform where you can upload now almost any kind of, of um, research question where you need people's input. And it started off um, as a way of classifying galaxies. So people had taken these big data sets um, in astronomy and uh, they were like surveys of a huge fraction of the sky and astronomers wanted to know how many uh, of galaxies were spirals, how many were elliptical, you know, and these are all to try and build up a picture of how galaxies evolve. And so they created this universe platform and asked the public to help. And so that was the first project that sort of got Luke's universe off the ground. If you go in there now, there's all sorts of fantastic projects um, ranging from the humanities to science. Um, I spent a, a while counting penguins in Antarctica recently. So it's really a fantastic platform. And so Tawanda used this, uploaded a whole bunch of uh, data sets and asked, he used a control group of uh, students at Stellenbosch University, crowdsourced those and asked to delineate areas of, of urban informality. And the idea would then be to use these um, crowdsourced delineations as input, um, as a sort of a training set so that in future one could go back um, and do this on a much bigger scale with machine learning. And so this uh, brings me back uh, again to the space that we're hoping to create at the OAD. I mean, we're not saying that we have all the skills, but we do have access at the OAD to this, um, you know, large number of astronomers, many of whom are, are driven by the curiosity of their research, but also do feel like they want to contribute to some of the um, problems, um, to some of our global challenges that we're facing. So. What we'd really like to do is to create this space, you know, in partnership with, um, with people from different fields who are working on some of these problems around development or um, around possibly even uh, climate change or, you know, ocean circulation, whatever they may be. Um, where can we find that common ground uh, to collaborate and really make a difference? So I think it's, I would really love to hear from you in the discussion. Um, our contact details are up here, the website, GitHub uh, and my email address. So thanks very much. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much for the, uh, for the presentation. I seriously liked it. Um, <laughs> I, I, I learned a bit about stars and light and everything. Um, which is already cool. <laughs> um, just quickly checking, I, I don't really see any questions in the chat yet. So people, if you have questions, um, just type them in the chat. We're also, I think we're with 25 people. If you have questions, unless everybody starts talking at once, you can also just open your mic uh, and, and ask your question. Okay, I don't really see any questions yet and nobody's opening their mic. Um, I actually have a, a, a few questions or comments and, and ideas. I mean, we've, we've talked before and I know a lot of things that already came up. Um, so, so there are a few things that I was actually wondering. So a few things you mentioned. So the Astro Lab, for example, I think that sounded really cool. Um, do you think we could set something like that up for languages as well? Yeah, I don't see why not. I mean, it's a, it could be a very, I don't know exactly what your requirements are, uh, you know, but I think I don't see why one couldn't, right? Hmm. Okay. So, so are yeah, you so just thinking of like working through, you know, introduction, introduction to sort of 
um, to to digital humanities, you know, at a sort of a undergraduate or graduate level that you could work through using this set of um, Python notebooks. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So people actually see that there is or there can be a relationship between language and computation, for example. I think a lot of people in the country really have no clue that that actually that it actually exists. Yeah. Uh, I do see um, uh, Susanna who says hi. I'm not sure if she wanted to say something. And I also see Tanya has opened the mic. Do you want to take Suzanne first or should I? Yeah, let's, let's as I see Suzanne just uh, uh, send a message. So let's, let's do that first. Apologies, did no enterment post. <laughs> Okay, I'm um, quite interested in using machine learning to help predict with which questions on literary analysis students would be capable of answering. So that's a great question, uh, Suzanne, and one that I don't know the answer to, but I do know who does know the answer to that. Um, so I think there's a, I don't know if you've heard of the, the Sia Vula Foundation, they uh, run um, tutorials for a high school students really and uh, and problems and they have a fantastic algorithm that um, helps to to give students uh, a question out of the question bank that they will get right 70 percent of the time so it's a it's a balance between challenging students and but not challenging so much that they become unmotivated and so i can pass those details on after the colloquium mm, that actually sounds really cool it reminds me of some completely different research which deals with computer games mm -hmm. so you want to have a computer game that's challenging in a way but it shouldn't be impossible to do but it shouldn't be too easy because then people find well it's not interesting so that's another <laughs> another link there uh tanya you had your microphone open earlier yes yes thanks for a very interesting talk and i'm actually surprised at um how much you know what we do mainly with languages and computers actually um, has a, has a common ground with astronomy. Astronomy, I, I had no idea to be honest. So that that's very insightful in itself. The thing that triggered me is you spoke about uh, Zooniverse, and I know I've looked into using crowdsourcing to do some annotation tasks uh, and things before. So can you talk a bit more about what Zooniverse is? Is it like is it just like a crowdsourcing platform or is it more? I'm just very curious about that. Thanks. No, it is just a crowdsourcing platform, Tanya. And uh, so it's just a website you go to in your browser. Um, so for example, if you are interested in projects, then you can look at, you know, if you are a part of the crowd, let's put it like that then you can just navigate there, see what kind of projects you're interested in. You know, is to, are you interested in classifying bees today or, or galaxies or whatever? And then you can sign up. Each project there will have a little tutorial. And then once you've gone through the tutorial, you can just get going. Um, and so, but I think as a researcher, you then can, can upload um, your own project onto that uh, platform and set it up the way you want. There's obviously help to get to get you going. Um, and then they advertise these projects on sort of a, I don't know, a weekly or a monthly basis and and get people to do them. I don't know if that answers your question. Definitely, thanks. It's very interesting. So I'll probably pursue it some a bit further. Thanks. Okay, wonderful. Any more questions? No hear anything see anything yet uh, I was actually quite interested look I can I can keep going I was actually quite interested in the um, the sentiment analysis project that you um, that that you did as well um, so first of all it, it's nice to see that there actually is a very large overlap between the different techniques that you use and that can be used for example in language um, so I think especially in South Africa some of these techni techniques are still relatively new um, for the digital humanities uh, uh, area. So I was actually quite interested in uh, I kind of two questions there. So one is, you, if you have people who know about the techniques, how do you check then the kind of linguistic knowledge that you also need? Did you work with linguists to do this? Or was it 
students who didn't really have a clue yet and were just kind of playing with the data? Or how, how does that work? So for this project, our goal was, uh, sorry about the dog, somebody's arrived. Um, so for this project, our goal was really just to train students in um, these techniques of, of machine learning. And so we didn't have an expert in linguistics and we very much, you know, uh, were kind of, of going in the dark and especially with these, um, these models like BERT, you know, I think we have uh, an astronomer who's been working on Nikita, who's been who's been putting the the, the um, hackathon or the tutorials together, but they were very much the focus was on showing the broad applicability of the tools rather than getting to an actual um, sort of research outcome in this particular case. But I think if you were to to push this a bit further and say you wanted to answer a specific research question in linguistics, then you would have to get somebody who has the expertise in that area to advise, right? Because, and I think that's very much the kind of space that we're hoping um, we'll have. Often we, you know, with this collaboration gateway. So for example, if you have a, a problem in whatever linguistics, then maybe you'll sort of describe that problem, put it on this collaboration gateway as, as onboarding material or something. And then we'll have astronomers or machine learning specialists who may read that and go, oh, okay, this looks like a pretty interesting problem to solve. And I wonder if we could use blah and blah for it, you know, and, and it, but then of course, talking to each other because, um, you know, it, it's clear that there has to be um, some overlap so that, that people know what the end goal is, right? I think astronomers just don't have the discipline specific knowledge to execute it alone. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, no, it definitely does make sense. So this is, I think one of the things that we've been struggling with a little bit as well, but then uh, on, a, on a smaller scale, because <laughs> you look at the, the, the wide applicability of these uh, these techniques. So, so I've been thinking, and, and that hasn't happened yet because I only see the problems and I don't know how to solve them yet. So that, that, that OAD uh, gateway um, sounds very interesting. It sounds a little bit like a marketplace, right? Where you can just kind of put your problems or your, you know, the, the things you want to solve up and then hopefully somebody will pick that up. Um, so I think we, we definitely need something like that. Uh, I was thinking about this in a kind of smaller scale, uh, say field linguists who want to um, know more about data cleanup, for example, or, well, that, that's like a small, small examples. Um, yeah, so I was actually wondering on that uh, OED gateway, how do you actually get the people together and how do you link these potential collaborators? Yeah, so we haven't really done that yet, but our plan for going forward is to to resurrect this, these kind of um, conversations that we had a while back. So we'll have around, um, you know, once, so I think a good way to proceed would be if you have one or two project ideas that you'd be keen to, to explore with astronomers, maybe write a, a sort of a brief description that we can put on this um, gateway. And then based on those projects, we'll have, um, you know, a kind of a, a Zoom meeting much similar to this one, or we can even consider doing it uh, in person if, if that's interesting, but uh, given our, our locations, then we can have a discussion around those and just kind of have a brainstorming with the part of the astronomy community. So, I mean, we have mailing lists that we can open up to many people. You can have a, a quick um, chat about the ideas and people can, can throw stuff around because it's not only about the solutions often, right? It's about finding somebody that's easy to work with, right? That's across a disciplinary boundary and that, you know, that you kind of have a, a working chemistry with, right? So I think we, so we plan to have these, uh, well, we used to call them full moon mashups, but they're just kind of uh, these brainstorming sessions around particular themes. And so if linguistics is one of the themes, that would be great. You know, maybe our, uh, Ocean currents is another theme that we've got somebody who's who's got a project on. So, okay, now that sounds really wonderful. So essentially, I challenge everybody here to come up with <laughs> with, with, with tasks that we can then uh, we can then work on. Um, I see Marissa also 
mentioned. So she agrees if everybody shares their little bits of work, we might be able to build a nice puzzle. Um, I, I hope we can also solve that puzzle at some point. <laughs> um, okay, Suzanne has another question, I think. I wonder if your platform allows a person to exercise only if they want to collaborate and possibly publish on research or if there are also opportunities to advertise if one would like to employ a person to assist with a specific part of a project. I imagine that sometimes our projects would not be all that interesting to another subject expert, even if their expertise might be quite useful to us. Well, you never know uh, what, uh, what appeals to them, but uh, I think so. I can also ask Kevin what his response is. Uh, Kevin's the director of the Office of Astronomy for Development, and he's also joined us here today. So I don't know, Kevin, if you want to, to see if the collaboration gateway can be pushed in that direction as well. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, I think it's, it's definitely uh, meant to be as flexible as, as, um, as we need it. Uh, so, what you're describing, Susanna, uh, uh, that's exactly the kind of thing that we want to uh, sort of use it for. If, if, so in the, um, uh, the idea is that anyone that wants to use it or that wants to, sorry, I'll, I'll just keep my um, Yeah, the idea is that anyone who wants to use this gateway or, or sort of tap into astronomers and stuff, uh, they would be able to specify this is the outcome we want. And so, you know, no matter how big or small an outcome you want, if you just want a specific collaboration on specific research, you just make that clear. And then, uh, um, you know, the rest of it is just giving the context of, of stuff. And then, uh, um, and then we can sort of reach out to different people, different, different collaborators that we've been speaking to. Okay, and I think wonderful. because this is also still under development, I'll put the link here. Um, you know, if you find that our description of, you know, what you need for onboarding material doesn't quite meet your, what you guys need, then just let us know. We can just refine it as we go along. Cool, great. I think we really need to kind of distribute this kind of information to the, to the field. Um, so I'm not sure if anybody else still has questions. You can just unmute if you want or type something in the chat. Okay, I don't see anybody doing that yet. Um, so I was really wondering, so this was really early on in your, in your presentation, uh, the link between the culture and society and how that influences the, the, the more numeric uh, research, which was on the other side of the slide. Is it that something like culture or ideas from culture and society kind of drive the research questions? Or what, what I, mean, I mean, I can see relations if you no, how do I say this? I can see the relevance individually, but I don't, I, I was wondering how yeah. do these kind of influence each other? Yeah, I don't know. I think that's a, a complex question that you guys are probably much a better place to answer than, than I am. So I also agree that I can see individually how that kind of interest and curiosity drives science. But, you know, I think once scientists become, you know, embedded in, in their work and driven by, you know, the current questions in the field, they sometimes forget that they are actually human. And, uh, and so a lot of of time, you know, that can be, you know, those kinds of bi biases and things can persist. And I'm sure it's the same in every field, right? Um, and you can kind of see how these ideas persisted when you think about, um, you know, when Einstein introduced um, this thing called the cosmological constant, because, you know, he had this idea in his head that the, the, the universe must be fixed. It can't be like expanding or contracting, right? And so that I think is an idea very much imposed by culture and the thinking of the time. And it was so strong that he always had to, um, to bring in this extra term to correct for it. Of course, it turns out that the universe is expanding, you know? So I think 
we often are we often do slip up in terms of, of culture but exactly how it influences our research directions i don't think i think i'm too deep in to be able to give a good answer about that okay thanks um i'm not sure if there are any other questions uh, I, I realized that this topic was a little bit different from our regular um the regular topics but i i think it gives really nice new ideas on uh, what we can do and especially focus a little bit more on the on the technical side at least from the uh, for the field of digital humanities are there any more questions i think we should all kind of check out the uh that collaboration gateway and see if we can we can do something there uh, anelda says very exciting to see that there are opportunities and ideas for future collaboration across these disciplines i i totally totally agree there Okay, I'm not sure if there are any other questions. I don't want to hog the whole the whole discussion here. Mena, if if we yeah. done with um, the I everyone, if we are done with um, the this part of the colloquium, I'm going to just use the opportunity to say that we've just in the meantime confirmed that. Um, educator is still open. So for people who are interested in developing open educational resources um, to help grow digital and computational skills in humanities and social sciences, the applications will open again today and the deadline will then be on the 28th of February. So there's 12 more days to get your submission in um, and there's 20,000 Rand um, uh, as a grant available to help you fund whatever activity you've got, um, you're thinking about in terms of developing your OER. And these OERs can be anything from a chapter, a textbook, uh, tutorials, videos, um, um, vocabulary, what do you call them? Dictionaries, um, anything that can be used in teaching, in teaching and learning in humanities and social sciences to grow digital and computational skills. So um, if you're interested, there's still time to apply. Thanks very much for the opportunity to say that, Mino. Okay, thanks, uh, Anola. Thanks for the information, and uh, thank you for hijacking this uh, <laughs> this DH colloquium. Um, now I wanted to say something else, but I can't remember. Oh yeah, so the initial. So some of you might have heard that initially, uh, Anelda um, and Anne, who's here as well, were going to uh, present. We've moved their presentation to a little bit later in time, so they will will come. Uh, just keep looking at the the, the new topics. Um, no, well, thank you so much, uh, Vanessa. We're now actually uh, almost over time, uh, so let's let's stop here. But uh, thank you so much for this presentation. I thought it was extremely uh, insightful, seeing the, the possibilities, kind of thinking a little bit outside the field of of the humanities about linguistics, but just looking at uh, what what else is out there and see that it's. I, I think it's actually quite doable to find collaborations, but we need to know where to find the right skills. So thank you so much for this uh, for this presentation. I thought it was wonderful. It was really really useful. Thanks very much, Mino. And yeah, please do get in touch uh, if we can answer any questions. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Vanessa, very much. That was great. Really interesting. Cool. Cheers. Bye, everyone. See you next month, and in the Escalator community. <laughs> <laughs>